Good evening. How many epigenetic engineers do we have here tonight? All of us. <laughs> right. I'm doing it right now. <laughs> <laughs> After this lecture, you're going to realize you've been an epigenetic engineer your whole life. And that uh, what we're going to learn tonight is the science behind the fact that your DNA is the hard drive to the computer and your and the software is the epigenome, which you can control. My name is Ron Peters. I graduated from UCLA School of Medicine quite a few years ago. At UCLA, I learned the pharmacological management of disease. And uh, it works well in the emergency setting, which I used for a while. But it doesn't work so well in addressing chronic illness. Symptomatic medical care for high blood pressure, heart disease, irritable bowel, arthritis, on and on and on, doesn't heal. It just suppresses symptoms. So what I've learned in healing I've learned since I graduated from medical school, and that's been a long and continuous study. <laughs> One day they might introduce healing into the curriculum of medical school. <laughs> so uh, here we go. This is an interesting topic. This is the iconic vision of the 20th century, the DNA double helix become a defining icon of our civilization. The DNA, if you think about it in science, that's the ultimate mystery, the ultimate, in many ways, accomplishment for science in our time. In 1953, Sir Francis Crick published the article, The Central Dogma of Molecular Biology. It later became what is called genetic determinism. DNA was the immutable blueprint that our cells must forever follow. Genes have been the dominant metaphor underlying explanations of all manner of human behavior, like sex, up to and including the practice of religion, the enjoyment of music, and the codification of moral laws. Genes have eclipsed the outside natural world as the primary driving force of evolution in the minds of many evolutionary biologists. Genetic determinism. We all hear about it day to day. He had brown eyes, big feet. He's a natural born athlete. Person has good genes. My father and grandfather and uncle got a heart attack that I'm likely to get one. On and on and on. In a book uh, called The DNA Mystique, the gene has become a super gene, an almost supernatural entity that has the power to define identity, determine human affairs, dictate human relationships, and explain social problems. In this context, human beings and all their complexity are seen as products of a molecular text, the secular equivalent of a soul, the immortal side of the true self and determiner of fate. The only problem is with this theory is that it's not true. <laughs> Otherwise, it sounds really good. There's, what we're going to go through tonight is that genetic determinism isn't accurate, that the nature versus uh, uh, DNA, genetic determinism, nature versus nurture, that that debate is a complex one. According to uh, who gets sick, the genes account for about 35% of longevity. And the most important issues have to do with lifestyle, diet, and environmental factors. Genes may directly determine simply physical characteristics such as eye color. They do not directly determine psychological phenomenon. This is an interesting presentation. Josephine these are, is an identical twin. She's 92 years old, straight back, firm jawed, vibrantly healthy, lives alone, travels around to her bridge groups, to the church and the grocery store, drives her car, outlived her husband, who died at 84, outlived three of her six brothers. 
Josephine's identical twin, exactly the same DNA, is incontinent, has had a hip replacement, has a degenerated disorder that has made her almost blind, lives in a nursing home, and is demented. Same genes, identical. It is known that identical twins, despite sharing the same genes, may not manifest the same psychiatric or other illnesses in the same way or not at all, despite the conditioning being thought to be highly genetic. It is more accurate to think of genes as provider of opportunity. The way I like to think of it is that genes is like the bullet in the gun, and what pulls the trigger is mind style and lifestyle. We've all heard of the Human Genome Project, the mysterious, the nucleus unraveling into this remarkable strand of double helix material called DNA. The hypothesis in the 1990s that they thought they would find 100, they expected to find 120 genes because they thought there's about 100 proteins that architect everything necessary for you to experience life in your body, in your body, and in your mind. There's about 100,000 operative g proteins. They thought there would be a gene for each protein and then another 20,000 or so to kind of keep it all organized. That was the working hypothesis. Proteins are basically carry out all of the duties encoded in DNA. The DNA creates proteins. The proteins enact the code to create living activity in the body. This is a hemoglobin molecule, a protein. Protein comes from the word of primary importance. This still applies in our society when it comes to diet. We still think protein is primarily important. Uh, so here is the DNA down here, and the messenger RNA brings together the amino acids from the diet to create long proteins, and those proteins create everything in your body, every function. What they actually found was 23,688 genes, quite a few less than what they expected. All, if all of the information required to construct and maintain a human being is not in the genes, where does it come from? Who is conducting the complex dance of assembly in multiple organ systems? One of the things that my ongoing fascination with studying health, healing, biology is that you have 100 trillion cells in your body, more or less. Within each cell, there's 60 billion biological reactions going on simultaneously. That complexity cannot be organized by anything chemical. That complexity also cannot be organized by anything electrical in the neurological system. That's an enormous complexity. The organizing field of that is quantum medicine. It is probably is the field itself, as Einstein said, the field is everything. The field is the organizing system that keeps the stars moving in the sky, the hummingbird flying around the house, and each of us living in our bodies. It's the field. Probably the field is what you could call God, an organizing intelligence. Probably not a fellow with a large beard. <laughs> sitting on a cloud. <laughs> this is research that was done at the Ohio State University College of Medicine where they took couples who were having marital strife. They created little wounds on their body with suction blisters. So it was a very precise wound. Then they were 
then they instructed the husband and wife to have a neutral conversation for a half an hour. And then for the next three, three weeks, they monitored the production of the three proteins produced by the body in association with wound healing. It's something that occurs every day in your body. You have micro wounds continuously. They're always being healed. It's the reason why a lot of these cancer treatments and anti-inflammatory treatments don't work because inflammation is essential for wound healing, but it's also part of any inflammatory condition in the body like cancer, heart disease, and everything else. So, so what they did is they monitored how well these precise wounds healed. Then they instructed the couples to discuss a topic on which they disagreed. And what they found is that wound healing proteins were depressed in couples who had a fight. Even a simple discussion of a disagreement showed slower wound healing. Couples with severe disagreements, wound healing was slowed by 40%. This is an article uh, published in Nature. Throughout the body's entire somatic network, our emotions are triggering hormonal and genetic responses. We all know this. Stress system is a pervasive influence. Uh, basically, if your body is releasing stress hormones, it's because the body believes, either because of a reality or your imagination, that you're in danger. The body cannot distinguish between somebody standing in front of you with a gun and you imagining, thinking about your inability to pay the mortgage next month. To your body, it's danger, I may not survive. Same stress hormones are released and those stress hormones tell the body we may not survive so the body withdraws energy to long-term projects such as hormone production, digestion, and immunity. You don't paint the garage if there's a tornado coming down the street. But this is even more than that. This is a doctor 2,000 years ago, said it very succinctly. <laughs> we are formed and molded by our thoughts. Those whose minds are shaped by selfless thoughts give joy when they speak or act. We are molded and formed by our thoughts. So epigenetics. Epigenetics is a study of heritable. That means they move from generation to generation, changes in gene function that occur without a change in the DNA sequence. The DNA remains the same, but the function and activity created by the DNA changes substantially based on an epigenetic phenomenon. The epigenome sits on top of the DNA, and we'll see a graphic in a minute. The sources that control gene expression come from signals that turn genes on and turn genes off. Some of these signals are chemical, like a stress hormone, cortisol or adrenaline. Some of them are environmental signals, like viruses and bacteria. And some of them come from inside the body, like emotional states. Some of them come from diet. And this is a um, gene expression is not determined solely by the DNA code, but by an assortment of proteins that tell the genes when and where to turn off. Environmental signals conveyed by hormones, growth factors, and other regulatory molecules but they don't alter the DNA. This is the DNA double helix, and this is the epigenome. It's a, called chromatin. It's a series of complex proteins called histones. They encase the DNA, and it actually uncoils and coils. Like most proteins, they uncoil and they coil. And when they uncoil or coil, they send signals through the cell wall. They send messages. The epigenome is what controls the expression of genes. So epigenetic is a study of the signals that turns the genes on and turns the genes off. As I said before, 
Some come from inside the body, some come from outside the body. Some of the signals are chemicals and some are electromagnetic. I'll show you in a moment one of the remarkable things that came from Bruce Lipton's research at Stanford is that there are certain integral membrane proteins that coil through the cell wall of every cell in your body and then they stick like a little antenna on the top of the cell, but they're not hormone receptor sites, they're not neurotransmitter receptor sites, they simply respond to sound. They simply respond to tone. There's a French doctor who is curing breast cancer in two women and they simply did vocal toning for two and one half hours every day. Every cell in the body is designed to respond to sound, tone, or music. It's why throughout history, mankind has been drumming, chanting, playing music forever, and it's because we're designed to respond to that. <laughs> we need that, we need that gong. This is an interesting study um, on mice and men. Mice and men have very different sizes, but they have quite similar genetics. <laughs> There's a mouse called the agouti mouse that differs in fur color. The agouti gene is related to a human gene that is expressed in certain types of obesity and type 2 diabetes. Agouti mice have yellow coat and they eat ravenously. And they have an increased incidence of cancer and diabetes and the offspring of the agouti mice have the same issues. This is an agouti mouse, yellow fur, overweight. This is a regular little fellow here, cute guy. Doctor at Duke University, Dr. Jurdle, he fed agouti mice mothers a diet rich in methyl groups. Methyl groups, folic acid, B12, various betaine, trimethylglycine, methyl groups. The methyl group, this is not complex chemistry. Methyl groups, we use them all the time. You know, they're, they're it's a prominent part of a healthy diet, methyl groups, B12, folic acid. The methyl groups work their way through the mother's metabolism and attach to the agouti genes in the embryos and the baby mice that would typically be agouti offspring were normal, slender, and healthy. This is where folate comes from, a methyl donor. Folate comes from foliage. Dr. Jertle wrote in several magazines, it was a little eerie and a little scary to see how something as subtle as a nutritional change in the pregnant mother, rat, not rate, could have such a <laughs> dramatic impact on the gene expression of the baby. The tip of the iceberg is genomics. The bottom of the iceberg is epigenetics. Everything in the body is governed by consciousness. As radical as that may seem to the medical profession, it's a, it's a truth. I don't think any illness from stub toes on has not related to a conscious or an unconscious issue. After many years of practicing medicine, I, I, this place is called mind-body medicine because all healing is mind-body healing. Sometimes you just have a enthusiastic belief system producing a robust placebo effect and you do very well because the practitioner explains to you enthusiastically. There was a study done on pharmaceutical drug reps coming to a doctor's office, many of which are young, attractive women, and they explain their wares very enthusiastically. They show the big charts of how this new antibiotic really does well the doctor gets all excited. He tells his next series of patients for the next six days with great enthusiasm how well this new drug works, and indeed it works better for the first six days. <laughs> but as time goes on, the enthusiasm wanes, the drug effect wanes, all
All healing is self-healing. All healing is governed by consciousness, either involuntary, accidentally, or purposefully. This is the science of epigenetics. This is a very interesting study. Dr. Ziff, McGill University, he noticed that some mother rats spend a lot of time licking and grooming their little baby rats, while other mothers did not. The nurtured pups showed marked behavioral change as adults. They were, quote, less fearful, better adjusted than the offspring of the neglected mothers. No newsflash, right? Makes sense. Even in a little baby rat. Nurtured rats treated their offspring in the same way that they were treated. Epigenetic changes once started in one generation can be passed to the following generation, and there's no change in the DNA. What Dr. Ziff did is he looked at the rat brains. This is a little part of the research here. And he realized the hippocampus was involved in the stress reaction. And there was a gene in the nurtured rats that dampened the stress response. That gene had been upregulated. The same gene existed in all the other rats, but it had been upregulated. No change in DNA, just more activity of this particular gene that calms stress. Higher levels of a chemical acetyl groups that facilitates gene expression by binding to the epigenome, creating an enzyme that created more calm, reduced stress. He injected the brain cavity of fearful rats with acetyl-raising chemicals. These, there's two groups of chemicals, methyl groups, what we've talked about, and acetyl groups that seem to have a primary function of modulating epigenomic activity to create various changes in DNA. To activate certain gene, quite another gene, methyl groups and acetyl groups. Fearful rats, when injected with the acetyl group, became less fearful. They injected the offspring of loving mothers with methyl groups. This time, the methyl group, unlike the previous study, it had a different effect, and even though the baby rats had a loving mother, they became fearful and anxious simply by modulating the DNA expression through a substance that affects the epigenome. Fast forward to human beings, there's a research study in San Diego where they took detailed psychological, social, and medical examinations on 17,000 people. Half of these people had had a childhood stressor, one or more, including alcoholic parent, divorce, separation, mental illness in the family, or domestic violence. The people raised in the dysfunctional family are five times more likely to be depressed, three times as likely to smoke, 30 times more likely to attempt suicide. A man with a high score was 4,600% more likely to use illegal drugs and these people are more likely to have chronic illness such as heart disease, lung disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, and cancer. This is an epigenetic effect. Also along the same line, children who were mistreated in this study had a gene that altered the metabolism of serotonin and dopamine. Serotonin is a calming <coughs> neurotransmitter which is upregulated by selective serotonin up intake in up inhibitors like Prozac, Val Prozac, Paxil, and all the rest. Hmm. So they had a genetic problem in having lower levels of serotonin and dopamine. I do a lot of work with uh, addicted people, street drugs, as well as drugs, particularly the benzodiazepine drugs. Those are very Benzodiazepine, Valium, Xanax, Librium, Clonopin, those drugs are very difficult for people to get off of. So they can't stop taking it. They feel anxious if they take it, and they feel anxious if they don't take it. Um, one of the things we're realizing is that some people have the inability from childhood 
to make energy within the cells of their body. It's a cellular energy defect where they don't make enough NAD. NAD is an activated form of vitamin B3. Vitamin B3 is like the spark plug to make energy within the cells of your body. And these people, and we think some of them have in, the, in some um, um, South, South African research, they're doing, using a lot of NAD, they trace it back to a issue intrauterine with the mother in her depression or some drug she took. So they compromise their ability to make energy so they, throughout their life, they're tired and depressed. And so these are the people that feel like, I now want to feel good, you know, I want to take a drug, and they're more likely to get addicted to that drug. Belief in the immune system. This is a work done at the University of Miami where they're trying to link immune function and belief systems. This is Dr. Ironson. People, the, she worked with um, HIV patients. People who view God as judgmental, God, have a CD4 helper, C, helper T cell count decline more than twice the rate of those who don't see God as judgmental. And their viral load increases more than three times faster. For example, a precise statement affirmed by these patients is, God will judge me harshly one day. This one item re related to an increased likelihood that the patient will develop an opportunistic infection or die. Once again, your belief system through epigenetics and through the creation of life experience shapes your reality. You know, I have patients who believe that things are going to be a certain way, and it's sometimes very hard to shift those belief systems. We all get belief systems from our parents, but growing up and living life, the goal is to delete the belief systems that are dysfunctional. This is part of her research published in the um, General Med Internal Medicine. During the first year after a diagnosis, an increase in spirituality predicts slower disease progression. People who had an increased spiritual awareness because of their illness showed 45% did, 42% didn't, 13% had less spirituality. <laughs> I guess they got angry. <laughs> Must have been an act of God. The study showed an enormously strong association between spirituality and the progression based again on belief systems. This was a study of 2,700 men studied over 10 years. One half of the men who engaged in regular volunteer activities had death rates of those, one half of those that did not. The author concluded altruistic side effects include reduced stress, improved immune system function, a sense of joy, peace, and well-being, and even relief from physical and emotional pain. Andrew Weil. A study of nearly 1,000 older adults followed for nine years concluded that people with high levels of optimism had a 23% lower risk of death from cardiovascular disease and a 55% lower risk of death from all causes compared to another group of pessimistically oriented people. If you view the world pessimistic, if you think something bad's going to happen, and you sustain that kind of belief, you increase the probability of something bad happening. It's not hard to understand, right? This is uh, Dean Ornish, University of California in San Francisco. <clears throat> he took a group of people with biopsy-proven prostate cancer But they had low Gleason scores, so they weren't candidates for radical treatments. <laughs> they declined surgery, radiation, and they went on this lifestyle program and nutritional program, and they were monitored very closely, 30 patients, three months. 
Their epigen epigenetic engineering program included 30 minutes of exercise every day, yoga or meditation for an hour a day. They had a social group, social support, communication. And they also ate a low-fat, plant-based diet of vegetables, whole grains, beans, and fruits. The results of that study that many of the disease-promoting genes, genes that create inflammation, uh, increased levels of um, endothelial growth factors, the kind of growth factors that a cancer cell will mobilize for its own renegade purpose, were turned off, whereas protective genes were upregulated or turned on. For example, a set of cancer-promoting oncogenes called RAS were downregulated in the men in the treatment program. The select an E gene, which promotes inflammation, is elevated in breast cancer, was downregulated. This is an example of the pre- intervention and these green areas are upregulated genes showing more activity based on the epigenetic influence of meditation, yoga, plant-based diet, and exercise. They also had weight loss, reduced blood pressure. Their cholesterol fell from 191 to 146. They had improved psychological functioning on two different scales, <coughs> noting less intrusive thinking and more physical fitness. They also experienced a 4% decrease in PSA in the experimental group, while the control group had a 6% increase in PSA. And then they took serum from the experimental group and they inject, they, uh, they applied that serum to prostate cancer cells in vitro in a little petri dish. And they um, showed inhibition of prostate cancer growth from the serum from the experimental growth. This was a study published by Norm Sheely. The work was done by Dr. Eisenick. 20-year study of 1,300 European subjects. They summarized into four personality types and then linked it to longevity. A lifelong pattern of feeling hopeless, a lifelong pattern of anger or blame, victim, blame, anger, bouncing between the two, and then a third group that he called self-actualized. Anybody familiar with the term self-actualization? Yeah, everybody people who are involved with their own growth process, right. 75% of the people who die of heart disease and 15% of those that die of cancer are a member of the Lifelong Anger Club. The hopeless group tend to die 35 years younger than those in group four, and 75% of these die of cancer, only 15% of heart disease. Remember type A behavior and heart disease? Type A behavior, we originally thought it was just being busy. But it's not so much the busyness, it's the hostility associated with the busyness. Because the type A personality learns in childhood that I will be loved if I produce. I will, mom and dad will love me if I produce. If I work hard, if I make money, and that belief system then is carried into adult life, and these people indeed do work hard and quite often make a lot of money, but they don't get loved necessarily, and that creates the hostility, the anger. In group four, self-actualizers tend to die of old age, and less than 1% die of cancer or heart disease. So how do you control your epigenome? What, um, what Ruth Lipton showed is that DNA is not really required for a cell to survive. He took cells with enucleate, he took the nucleus out of cells and the cell will still live without a nucleus. 
The proteins that create the structure and proteins create the structure and function of a cell. Protein activity is derived from conformational changes. What that means is a protein is a long, often spiral, convoluted type of structure, and it's the change, the dynamic in that conformation that creates expressive activity in the cell. When the signal detaches from the protein, it re returns to its original state. It's the presence or absence of the signal that activates protein behavior. When it comes to DNA, as we discussed, methylation and acetyl groups are involved in activating or silencing a gene. Some of the things that we have found so far are resveratrol, quercetin, curcumin, and the deacetylase inhibitors. This is a human cell, and all of these outside are, actually these are cilia, but this is the nucleus. This is the mitochondria where energy is made. This is where people sometimes have a long-term defect in energy production. These are the people that tend to get depressed and fatigued chronically. Um, and this is the cell wall. See, this is a protein, and it comes out, and it has senses on it. When, when it attaches to whatever it's receptive to, this conformation changes, sends a message inside the cell. These are what Bruce Lipton said and others. It's the cell wall that's actually the brain of the cell. The cell will work well just because of the cell wall activity. Environmental signals control protein behavior. Life is derived from the coordinated integration of environmental signals with behavior producing proteins. Therefore, the brain or the command center of the cell is the cell wall, not the nucleus. The nucleus is like the library. It's like the hard drive. This is another example of complex sensing systems outside, and then inside is the filaments, the skeleton of, of the, this is a lipid layer. These are triglycerides. One of the big problems with cell walls is when you have uh, fatty acid oxidation and there's actually holes. When you have saturated fats and the American diet creates def defects in the cell wall, which is actually the brain of the uh, cell. He discovered integral membrane proteins. Some of them are receptors and then effectors that create protein activity within the cell. This is an integral membrane protein. They stick outside, they go through the wall. Some of these only respond to sound, tone. What happened with the research on the the people who listen to certain tones for a long period of time is a process of entrainment. Any disease in the body is a, is a lack of harmony in that particular collection of cells creating an organ. When you, en when you entrain, when you create a harmonic influence, it creates harmony within the diseased unharmonious section creating improved health. So these integral membrane proteins, your body is listening to physical signals like sex hormones, stress hormones, but it's also listening to electromagnetic signals including light, sound, and radio frequencies. This is how we believe the quantum field is capable of organizing a trillion cells. What he, what Bruce Lipton researched is that you can divide all of the gene programs into two basic groups, growth and reproduction and protection. What he did is he took single-celled organisms and he put them in a little dish 
and he made it so it was a very healthy environment for these, these single-celled microscopic organisms. When the single-celled microscopic organisms felt safe, they had an abundant food supply, there were no predators, they were happy, communicating, then they grew and they turned on growth-oriented protein systems. Reproduction, digestion, metabolism. But when they changed the environment by putting in the, the, some molecular substance from a predator, or they changed the pH, or they changed the light, then the cell sensed it, and they went into protection, protection, reducing growth. Growth behaviors are associated with attraction. Protection behaviors are associated with danger and repulsion. And so then what he did, as you know in his book, The Biology of Belief, is that the body the cells are responding to these belief systems. If you believe that life is dangerous, if you feel the world is hostile, the body believes that. It's the biology of belief. So the cells will go into a state of protection. On the other hand, if you have the belief system that even the challenges in life are opportunities for growth, and you maintain this, can see the blessing in every experience, feel feelings, maintain a growth process, then you move from a cellular danger protection to growth, not only physically, but also psychologically. He said that attraction, love, growth, repulsion, fear, protection, were the two. Franklin Roosevelt said it easily, the only thing to fear is fear itself. Fear is the essential, people consider it to be the pole to love, fear, love. And it has a dramatic influence on the body. We live in a time now where the entire population is learning lessons about fear. And it's important how we do during this class because those that are not capable of understanding fear and how powerful it is are going to probably be in for a turbulent ride in the times to come. The people who can see that we create our experience, what we focus on is what we experience to some extent, will be able to make it through. It's a very difficult time now. So epigenetic engineering, what we eat, how we live, how we love and our love influences our genes, how our genes behave. When you understand that with every feeling and thought in every instant you are performing epigenetic engineering in your own cells, you suddenly have a degree of leverage over your health and happiness that can make a critical difference. Every experience you have, whether it's a financial stress whether it's a serious disease, a minor disease, whether it's a relationship stress, it's all there for the purpose of your own growth. And what I believe and what I've learned from great teachers is that the emotional experience contained within that drama that you created unconsciously leads to the resolution of the issue. It's the emotion that needs to be brought out of the unconscious mind so as to be made, so the unconscious mind can gradually become conscious. So there is no hidden agenda in the unconscious mind. The goal of the self-actualized life process is, is self-knowledge, where there is no unconscious agenda, where there is no wounded child inside that needs to get your attention through drama. Look at that beauty. These are some of the more powerful epigenetic foods. Soy-based foods, cauliflower, broccoli, cabbage, green tea, fava, bean, kale, kale, that's my wife's favorite, red <laughs> grapes, and turmeric. 
These are some of the biologic, some of the plants that are now showing up everywhere with bioactive molecules. You know, in cancer treatment in our society, we've spent 60, 70 years looking for a magic bullet. We probably haven't found the magic bullet. What we are finding out through the use of a variety is more an enchanted shotgun. There are lots of biologically active in our foods that are very powerful at epigenetic and other physiologically modifying chemicals. These are some of the, for example, these are foods known to suppress tumor growth. Aloe, soy, basil, propolis, turmeric, on, lycopene, certainly garlic. These are some of the targets for these activities. Growth factors, cell proliferation, angiogenesis, anti-inflammatory, NF-kappa beta inhibitors, cell differentiation, the ability to handle drugs, on and on. There they are in their natural form. This is an interesting study. This was done, published in Science in 2005. This is quite surprising. This was actually funded by one of the big drug, by one of the big chemical companies. <laughs> they exposed a pregnant rat to high dose of a class of pesticides known as endocrine disruptors, which causes an inherited reproductive disorder in male rats that is passed on without any genetic mutation. It is not a change in the DNA sequence but it's a epigenetic change creating a chemical modification of the DNA. This was another study. They exposed mice with genetic memory problems to an environment rich with toys, exercise, and extra attention. These mice showed significant improvement in long-term potentiation of form of neural transmission that is the key to good memory. Surprisingly, their offspring also showed long-term potentiation improvement, even when the offspring got no extra attention. So this is clearly an epigenetic phenomenon. Epigenetics is helping usher in a new paradigm that reveals how bankrupt the phrase nature versus nurture really is. He refers to epigenetics as the most important discovery in the history of heredity since the gene. And finally, most probably remember, this was a complex study that I'm going to review briefly. There's a place in uh, Sweden called Norboten. It's very isolated. It's been that way for a long time. It's so remote that if the people there don't have food, there's nobody to come and help them. If they have a bad harvest, that's it. That's just the way it is. They're not calling anybody on the phone and getting a, getting a shipment. The starving years were all the cooler for their unpredictability. 1800, 1812, 1821 were years of total crop failure and extreme suffering. There was nobody to come to their aid. Whereas the 1801, 1822, 1828, 1844, and 1863, the land spilled forth with abundance. The situations were ripe for great harvest. And the people who were hungry were able to gorge themselves. <laughs> Dr. Lars Olaf Birgren, Preventive medicine specialist has been studying these people for a long time because they all stay there. You know, they don't they don't head to LA or anything. He took random samples of these people born in this time and he used historical records to trace their parents because it's a very isolated controlled group. Through a meticulous an an analysis, he determined how much food had been available to the parents and the grandparents when they were young. What he found out is that boys who enjoyed those rare overabundant winters, kids who went from needing normal to gluttony in a single season, 
produced sons and grandsons who lived shorter lives. The grandsons of boys who had overeaten died an average of six years earlier than the grandsons of those who had endured a poor harvest. Once they controlled for certain other variation, the difference in longevity jumped to an astonishing 32 years. If your grandparents had a gluttonous time, it's passed epigenetically to you, creating all of the adverse effects associated with weight gain, diabetes, heart disease two generations later. It applied to long female lines as well, meaning that the daughters and granddaughters of girls who had gone from normal to gluttonous diets also lived, these are daughters and granddaughters, also lived shorter lives. To put it simply, the data suggests that a single winter of overeating as a youngster could initiate a biological chain of events that would lead one's grandchildren to die decades earlier than their peers. That's how potent this stuff is. Just like the research with, uh, I think that's, basically it's, it's said in German New Medicine that stress of the parent becomes the biology of the child. When I see cancer patients or any patient, I will always generally ask about what it was like for your mother when she was pregnant with you. Was that a difficult time for her? Was it a happy time for her? Also, it's very important what occurred at birth and what occurred during that first year of life because the child is highly imprinted during that time. The stress of the mother becomes the biology of the child. Yes. That's the first time in our society, first time ever known that the children are likely to live a sh shorter life than their parents because of our lifestyle, our junk food diet, our high stress. This is also very interesting. This is the one I was thinking about earlier. He wanted to see if these pesticides would affect pregnant rats and their offspring. He treated the animals, the pregnant mother, with these pesticides and then started seeing between six months to a year a whole host of other diseases that he didn't expect. This ranged between tumors like breast and skin tumors, prostate disease, kidney disease, and immune dysfunction. The next step was to go to the next generation and the same disease state occurs. So we did several repeats and got the third generation showing it and then a fourth generation we sat back and realized, even in the second, third, and fourth generation, they were not exposed to pesticides. They were carrying the effect of the earlier generation's intrauterine exposure to pesticides. This is quite a shocking kind of thing. We started seeing major diseases in 85% of the animals of every generation. We knew that if an individual was exposed to an environmental toxin, they could get a disease. The new phenomenon is that the environmental toxin no longer affects just the individual exposed, but two or three generations down the line. We knew, I knew epigenetics was a controller factor for DNA activity, but to say that epigenetics would have a major role in disease development, I had no concept for that. Further work, the implications, further work has revealed epigenetic marks in 25 segments of the rat's DNA. The implications, if applied to humans, are quite staggering. That research was funded by a drug company that made pesticides. <laughs> and this, this move, this research didn't get brought out. They wouldn't let the research come out for quite some time. It's called the ghost in your genes. It's a, it's a, we showed it here once before. It's remarkable. This is also a rather interesting research done at the Heart Math Institute. They trained 10 individuals who were trained in a heart-focused coherence technique. In other words, these people were trained like meditators to feel this to generate and sustain and expand feelings of love and appreciation in their heart. They were really uh, 
capable and did a lot of practice in meditation. They evoke feelings of love and appreciation while intending to cause a sample of test tube DNA to either wind or unwind. They had DNA, human DNA in a test tube in another room. And then they had these people in another room who were generating feelings of compassion and love compared to another group with no training in heart math. The group that entrained to a heart coherent state invoking feelings of love and caring while intending to modify the DNA achieved conformational changes up to 25% in the DNA at a distance. The untrained group created no change in the DNA. The placebo effect is an example of epigenetics, my, mo the most, my favorite example of a placebo effect, which is well known, widely, it may be the most healing occurs because of a placebo effect, <laughs> as challenging as that may be <laughs> to our belief system. This was uh, uh, Baylor University, 2008. They took men with severely arthritis osteoarthritic knees that could barely walk. Half of them went to the OR, had anesthesia, two incisions, but immediately sewed up and sent to recovery, believing they had normal arthroscopic surgery. The other half went to the OR, had anesthesia, two incisions, and then the orthopedist this time put the arthroscope in, trimmed up the knee, tidied it up like they usually do, sewed it up, sent them to the uh, recovery room. What happened is that both groups over the course of the next two years had identical resolution of pain and improved mobility. Published in the New England Journal of Medicine. So the tools for epigenetic engineering, good nutrition, detoxification, healthy behavior, stress reduction, and then the expansion of love particularly self-love and the love of others and the love of mankind. And that's the end of our talk. <laughs> Any questions?